comes a long way from the National University Cancer Institute in Singapore. And we're looking forward to your talk. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the University Hospital Zurich for, uh, and especially Rolf Stahl for uh, inviting me to uh, speak at this uh, really wonderful uh, meeting. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's really high quality uh, uh, talks and hopefully I can keep up with the same uh, quality. So um, these are my disclosures. So basically I've been asked to talk about combining targeted therapy with immune therapy. And uh, this is the brief overview on giving the rationale. Uh, because I'm a thoracic oncologist, I'll be mainly giving uh, data on uh, non-small cell lung cancer. But um, in deference to the other specialists, there will be also more important learnings from the other studies that actually have more favorable outcomes compared to non-small cell lung cancer. OK, so we know that immune checkpoint inhibitors have uh, broad anti-tumor activity, and there has been multiple approvals in a whole bunch of solid tumors, as well as lymphomas, uh, in, 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 um, with the use of PD-1 and PD-1 inhibitors. And uh, there are multiple uh, reasons why it's, uh, it's uh, useful, that, but the mechanisms of action for immune checkpoint inhibitors involve priming the T cells and removing the uh, co-inhibitory uh, signals, as well as uh, uh, enhancing the co-stimulatory uh, signals. And finally, this results in improvement in uh, tumor response. And, and one of the ways to uh, also that affects uh, anti-immune uh, 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 checkpoint inhibitor activity is the tumor microenvironment and actually agents that's been uh, um, undergoing development to try to modulate the tumor microenvironment. Okay, so this is a, a cartoon, a, a capillary survival curve of the IPASS study. These are the updated results from JCO. Um, and can you see here that there's actually a decline in the uh, um, uh, overall survival over time. So there's, there's no plateauing of the curve, and that's something that you don't want to see. And then, and then with uh, the long-term follow-up of, um, of long-term use of a nivolumab with the five-year uh, outcomes, you can see it's about 16% improvement, or 16% uh, of five-year overall survival with the use of a uh, nivolumab in the pre treated setting. So you can see here in the... Um, capillary survival curve, that's a plateau from year three onwards to uh, year five. There's only a drop in about 2% of, of, uh, in, in, over that period of time. So this is a suggestion of plateau here. So basically, we were trying to do by combining both uh, targeted therapy, which is uh, seen here in the dark, blue, uh, dark brown line uh, with immune checkpoint inhibitors, which you can see there's a plateau there, is to try to improve uh, the uh, tail of the curve, uh, as well as improve the initial uh, 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 survival curves uh, initially that is seen with uh, targeted therapy. So th the use of combination therapy uh, with uh, targeted therapy as well as immune therapy is a very common strategy, and there's been uh, lots of trials, uh, as you can see here uh, in the review paper that was published last year in Annals Oncology, that um, combining both immune checkpoint here with multiple other agents, such as targeted therapy, chemotherapy, radiation and so forth is actually is a lot more common, especially with the major uh, uh, compounds of pembrolizumab, nivolumab, as well as dervalumab and atezolizumab. Okay, so um, immune checkpoint inhibitors is an ideal backbone because uh, it has, as I said before, has broad anti-tumor activity and you've heard from previous speakers that a single agent is actually has quite a favorable toxicity profile. So uh, when we combine it with uh, other agents as listed here, uh, one of the, uh, some of the factors that we had to take in consideration is that the combination with the other agent has to be safe. And then the additional uh, combination shouldn't interfere with the immunotherapeutic mechanism of action that actually drives the anti-tumor response. And finally, we really like to see uh, synergistic activity, uh, um, uh, if not, maybe additive activity. So both the uh, tumor cell as well as the immune cells actually share uh, common signaling uh, uh, pathways. So on the cartoon on your, on your left is the uh, tumor cell uh, signaling the pathways, and on your right is the T cell uh, uh, signaling pathways. So you can see one of the common uh, uh, signaling pathways is the resmf mac uh, pathway that's seen in, in both the tumor cell as well as in, in, in T cells. And, and secondly, the PI3K AKT pathway is also shared between both tumor cell and in the, uh, um, and in the T cells. So this provides a rationale for using target therapy, which can modulate uh, the, the T cells as well as uh, uh, impair uh, molecular signaling in, in the tumor cell uh, as well. 
And these are just some examples of some of the targeted agents that can modulate uh, immune cell. And of course, these are the agents that initially has been developed as, as uh, uh, against the tumor cell, but also has uh, uh, immune monitoring effects uh, as seen here. All right, so we'll move on into looking at combining immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, with uh, EGFR TKIs. So a bit of uh, preclinical. So pd one expression is actually elevated in uh, EGFR-positive uh, uh, tumor samples, both in, in cell lines as well as in, in, uh, in human resected samples as well, as shown here. And then in, uh, in um, uh, mouse uh, uh, models, the activation of EGFR actually results in the increased pd one expression. And when you block um, um, uh, EGFR, you actually have a reduction in pd one expression as well. So, so based on the premise uh, of uh, these preclinical findings, there's been a lot of early phase studies that have looked at uh, combining uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors with uh, EGFR TKI. It's a quite a busy table, and there's a lot of data to go through. So I'll go through them a little bit slowly. So the first one we want to look at is a phase one study uh, from the TATIN study, which is a, a three-arm study that looked at osimitinib with various combinations of targeted therapy. And the one we were just focused on is the use of osimitinib which is the third generation EGFR TKI with, with duvalumab, which is a pda one inhibitor. So the uh, responses is around about 70% of patients in the cohort that is EGFR TKI naive. And that is actually very similar to what we expect with single agent EGFR TKI, which is around about 65%. But of note, then you can see here that the uh, incidence of grade three, four institutional uh, 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 lung disease is about 15%, which is uh, unacceptably high. So to give you a reference, uh, with osimitinib, the uh, chance of getting grade three, four pneumonitis is about 4% based on the floral data. And uh, with, uh, with duvalumab, the risk of getting grade three, four pneumonitis is around about 4% as well. So you, you, don't, you actually get synergistic toxicity when you combine these two agents together. And then in uh, another study combining gefitinib with duvalumab, the responses, as you can see, is also very similar to single agent EGFR TKI. Uh, however, the risk of getting a, a transaminitis is actually quite high, uh, um, more than double than, than what you expect with single agent EGFR TKI use, or even with uh, single agent uh, um, immune checkpoint inhibitor use. And then um, with, uh, uh, with allotinib, this is a study, a very nice study, because you have uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitor as a common drug, but you have two different cohorts, one looking at allotinib, the other one looking at gefitinib uh, in combination with pembrolizumab. So they actually, there are differences in terms of the response rates. You can see here that when you combine allotinib with pembrolizumab, the response rate is around about 40%, and the duration of response is 18 months. However, in contrast, when you combine gefitinib pembrolizumab, the response rate is only 14%, and this is shockingly low, as, as the patient population, these are EGFR TKI naive patients. And the incidence of toxicity is also markedly different uh, as well when you compare between the lotinib pembro versus gefitinib pembro. You can see here the incidence of grade 3 4 rash is 8%. In contrast with the gefitinib combination with pembro, the incidence of grade 3 4 liver toxicity is 70%. So perhaps there are differences in how you combine uh, or, um, both immune checkpoint inhibitors and a particular type of targeted agent. Uh, similarly, with, um, with Charlie Rubin's uh, pa uh, phase one study of using a lot in it with a tezolizumab, response rate similar to what's expected. The duration response is quite long, though, at 19 months. And the incidence of uh, toxicity is less than 10% uh, with uh, liver or skin toxicity and, and fever. Again, so some, some are giving me a suggestion that perhaps the different EGFR TK high when combined with mean chapter inhibitors may have different uh, toxicity rates. Again, uh, with uh, lotinib and nivolumab, um, incidence of grade 3 4 diarrhea is acceptable around about 10%. However, uh, response rate is 15%, which is low, but then these are patients who have prior treatment with lotinib already. And finally, uh, a paper that I will go through in a little bit more detail in the next slide is the combination, is a randomized phase 2 study of uh, osimitinib plus duvalumab versus osimitinib alone. And the response rate is very similar. And in fact, there was no difference, uh, there was no reports of grade 3, 4 pneumonitis in this particular randomized phase 2 study. Um, when, when compared with the first uh, study that I showed you, where the risk of pneumonitis when you combine these two agents together was 15%. Right, so this is the study in more detail. So interestingly, there was actually no uh, uh, a risk of grade three, four toxicity when you combine both OC and duvalumab in this particular study. And when you compare that with uh, uh, OC mutant alone, there's actually a lot more grade three 
uh, uh, plus toxicity. So, um, and then, and, and then like, just to highlight again, this table here shows absolutely no great risk for toxicity in using the combination therapy. So perhaps the, uh, the drug company may have prematurely uh, stopped the, uh, the phase one study uh, because of the concerns for pneumonitis, but th this uh, 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 study here uh, seems to be con uh, uh, con in contradiction to the, region, uh, to, the, uh, uh, the, to the first phase one study. Food for thought. And there was only one case of uh, grade two pneumonitis in this uh, small study of around about 30 odd patients. Okay, so there are other agents that has been uh, used as well. So this is just an example of combining uh, efatinib to pembrolizumab. Um, and these are for patients who have had uh, acquired resistance to EGFR-TKI, and they don't, don't expect any much uh, response, and the response rate is less than 20%, and the progression-free survival was actually less than three months. But of note, though, it just suggests that there is uh, actually, is tolerable, and actually were no DLTs uh, were actually seen uh, when you combine a fatinib with pembrolizumab. And based on the, uh, this uh, uh, small study, the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the pharmaceutical company has moved on to look at a single arm phase two study combining both a fatinib and pembrolizumab uh, in this uh, Luxlung uh, IO study or Keynote 497. So here, I won't go through the study design. So it appears that there may be still some uh, uh, efforts that are being made to try to combine EGFR-TKIs with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor. All right, so let's move on to combining uh, elk tkis of immune checkpoint inhibitors. Again, a similar background is pd one expression is also elevated uh, in both elk positive cell lines and, and in uh, and resected tumor samples. And uh, basically, when you um, uh, give an elk tki you can also get a reversal of T-cell suppression as well. And again, similar sort of table, lots of trials done in uh, early phase setting, uh, combining both these uh, agents together. Um, basically, the, the bottom line for these trials is that there's actually a higher risk of getting uh, toxicities. The incidence of uh, skin toxicity and, and liver toxicity is around about 20% uh, in some studies. And then when you combine both crizotinib with nivolumab, the grade 3 4 uh, liver toxicity was un unacceptably high, around about 40%. And, and um, there's no synergy in terms of uh, efficacy was seen, and response rates around about only about 70 to 80 percent uh, when you combine these two uh, agents together, and response rate when you give elk TKR alone is around about 70 percent. So there's really no uh, synergistic activity when you combine it. In fact, by combining treatment, because of increased risk of toxicity, you actually uh, um, uh, hamper the efficacy of, the, of the, both drugs, and you require a, a cessation of the drugs because of the toxicity. And this is the result, for example, in the, this study on the right here, was because of the high risk of liver toxicity, it impaired the efficacy of the drugs, which resulted in a lower uh, response rate, around about 40%. Okay. So the uh, combination of both immune checkpoint inhibitors in, uh, and in oncogene-driven lung cancers, actually is, there, there are challenges in, the, in this setting because oncogene uh, uh, non small cell lung cancer actually has an inflamed tumor microenvironment and also has a social with low uh, tumor mutational burden. And so these are some examples. There are lots of papers on this. So I'll just give an example. It's one from China, and this is um, a foundation medicine uh, po a poster. You can see here that there's a, a reduced uh, T-cell infiltration in um, EGFR immune non small cell lung cancer, and a sort of tumor mutation burden is actually very low in uh, oncogen-driven uh, non small cell lung cancer, as seen here with uh, elk positive lung cancer, and so as EGFR sensitizing mutation non small cell lung cancer, the median TMB is less than four. And then PD-1, in fact, may not be a very reliable uh, biomarker in EGFR-positive lung cancer. In fact, we found that there was an inverse relationship between uh, EGFR-positive lung cancer and PD-1 expression. So there's actually a lower chance of having PD-1 uh, positivity uh, if, uh, patient, uh, if the lung cancer is EGFR-positive. And we do know that actually PD-1 expression, uh, through a lot of preclinical work, has have shown that it's, uh, it's actually upregulated by oncogenic signaling uh, and not by adaptive immune response, which is normally seen in uh, wild-type uh, non-small cell lung cancer. So in fact, that the biomarker is really a, a false positive biomarker uh, for treatment efficacy. So this is an example of what happens uh, when you try to uh, give single-agent pembrolizumab in high pd one uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And this is for EGFR-positive patients. So it's a very brave study coming out of the west coast of the U.S. In which they gave uh, single-agent pembrolizumab in the first-line setting for EGFR-mutant non-small cell lung cancer, in which the uh, pd one expression was at least 1%. 
And the investigators actually enrolled uh, eight of the uh, 11 patients actually had a p down expression of more than 50%. And despite that, the response rate was actually zero because once you take out the waterfall uh, bar that was yellow, which was actually a uh, EGFR wild type, it was initially EGFR mutant, but uh, on subsequent forensic uh, uh, mutation analysis, it was a wild type EGFR, the response rate was 0% in the uh, use of pembrolizumab in, in high pd one EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, or more importantly, uh, in some of the patients who actually seized pembrolizumab and have followed up with uh, EGFR TKI, there were two patients had severe toxicity. Uh, one patient had a grade three transaminitis as well as grade three diarrhea, and unfortunately, one patient actually succumbed to uh, 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 to pneumonitis uh, following um, the use of a lotinib following uh, cessation of pembrolizumab. So perhaps there was, um, that as we heard earlier this morning, uh, that there's a long half life of, uh, of immune checkpoint inhibitors, and there's no doubt that the um, that the pembrolizumab will be still um, in, in circulation after stopping it and, and, and starting a lot of it, and probably end up having like combination of pembrolizumab and a lot of it in this particular patient. Okay, so just to summarize for the uh, combination of immune checkpoint inhibitors and molecular target therapy, in the EGFR positive or L positive lung cancer, the, um, the tumor microenvironment is not very friendly to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And we have seen in, uh, in lots of studies that the use of single agent immune checkpoint inhibitors actually have low activity. So it's an ideal uh, uh, way to actually combine both. But unfortunately, by combining both immune checkpoint inhibitors and, and molecular target therapy, actually, there's actually increased and uh, quite often unpredictable uh, uh, grade three, four toxicities, and there's clearly no uh, synergistic activity when you give these two agents together. And then you also already have a high challenge, increased challenge with the uh, 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 very efficacious uh, use of single agent uh, targeted therapy. And of course, in the last so many years, the therapeutic landscape in the management of first line uh, non small cell lung cancer EGFR positive is actually changing uh, every major conference. So, uh, so there's a lot of challenges that's been faced in trying to combine both uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors and molecular target therapy at, uh, in, in this setting. So how about moving on to giving anti-angiogenic agents to immune checkpoint inhibitors? So it's ideal, so because VEGF is actually um, has both oncogenic and immune molecular effects, and originally uh, anti-VEGF agents has been approved for use uh, in combination with chemotherapy in advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer with uh, chemotherapy and bevazuzumab has been approved because it uh, has increased uh, overall survival and PFS benefit. And the oncogenic effects of, uh, of VEGF includes uh, uh, tumor angiogenesis and it also confers resistance to EGFR TKI. Furthermore, there's also immune molecular effects to VEGF. This includes uh, um, uh, inhibition of dendritic cell maturation and, and, um, and decreased uh, T cell activation. Also, it reduces uh, um, T cell infiltration into the tumor and also upregulates uh, uh, regulatory T cells and myelot uh, derived uh, uh, suppressor cells. So by, if we can block VEGF, this uh, can improve uh, immune activation and improve uh, T cell trafficking, and also can reduce the immune uh, suppressive cells such as the Tregs and the uh, myeloid derived uh, suppressive cells. So there is a rationale for trying to add uh, anti-VEGF agents to uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. So this is a nice phase one study. It was a nice proof of concept that you can add uh, uh, tizoluzumab to bevazuzumab, and this is in treatment naive, uh, uh, advanced stage ACC. And you got a response rate of 60%, which is unheard of in, uh, in this setting here. And the standard of care, which is serafinib, the response rate is around about f 3 to 4% in the first line setting. So this is an amazing result in a phase one study. And this phase three study is ongoing to try to confirm these results. Okay, and then this is in Power 150. Um, uh, so basically, you know, this is a three-arm study examining the, the role of uh, adding uh, tizoluzumab to ECOG 4599, which is carbapaclitaxel and bevazuzumab. So uh, I won't go through the, uh, the ITT uh, results, but basically the bottom line was that in subset analysis, around about 10% of patients who harbored uh, uh, EGFR mutations in this particular study, they found that on subset analysis, there was improvement when you add a tizoluzumab to uh, carbapaclitaxel and bevazuzumab. So you can see the median PFS went from seven months to 10.2 months, and so the, uh, and the hazard ratio showed a 40% uh, reduction in, in, uh, in, um, in progression uh, with, uh, with uh, a tizoluzumab to uh, the, the three-drug combination. 
And then the overall survival also suggested there was an improvement uh, when you add atezolizumab to uh, a chemo and, and bevacizumab. And the hazard ratio again was, uh, was similar with a 40% reduction in the risk of death when you add atezolizumab to the three drug combination. So because these are subset analysis, there are multiple trials that are ongoing looking at um, the addition of uh, atezolizumab to bevacizumab in lung cancer uh, as, seen, as seen here. Um, and um, so there are lots of trials to try to confirm the, the Empower 150 uh, uh, study. And as well as there are also other trials looking at combining uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors with antiangiogenic agents. So let's move on to something more positive, which is um, the, uh, trying to combine uh, targeted therapy with immune checkpoint inhibitors and uh, just go through some other tumor types. There are lots of other tumor types, and my apologies I, if I don't mention your particular tumor of uh, interest. So the first one is the uh, poster boy for immune checkpoint inhibitors, as well as targeted therapy. But the early uh, uh, trials trying to combine uh, targeted therapy and immune checkpoint inhibitors were actually very challenging. You can see there were high rates of toxicities. So this is a... Um, a, um, a study uh, of a um, very small sample size, and in fact, of the seven patients who received both uh, um, the uh, Tremi and the Debref in, in addition to ipilimumab, two of the patients developed uh, bowel perforation and colitis. And then in the phase one study, there was a report in the New England Journal of giving Remerefinib followed by, uh, with a, in the run-in period, followed by in combination of ipilimumab, 60% of patients developed grade three transaminitis, which is uh, unacceptable, and therefore that particular uh, combination was ceased. And then there was another phase two study. You can see here that the um, risk of toxicity is slightly lower when you give it in a sequential fashion of, of giving uh, Remerefinib followed by ipilimumab. However, the response rate was, was quite low, um, uh, although the uh, grade, three to grade three, four toxicity was acceptable around about 10 to 20 percent. But more recent uh, studies of combining uh, BRAF targeted agents with immune chopper inhibitors actually have been a, a lot more successful. And you can see here that the outcomes are very impressive when you uh, give combination of BRAF inhibitors uh, plus MAC inhibitor. Uh, for, uh, with uh, either as a run-in period or, uh, or in combination with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, you've got response rates of around about uh, 70 to 85 percent, and in some cases uh, around about 100 percent. And then in terms of toxicities, toxicity was actually uh, quite tolerable. The uh, discontinuation rates was quite acceptable, and um, Although it sounds like the 40% of patients had grade three, four toxicities, this is in keeping with uh, um, of having uh, both, for example, a combination of epinevo, for example, the risk of grade three, four toxicity is around about 50% in any case. Okay, so, uh, so these are some of the promising results of using both uh, BRAF MAC inhibitors in combination with immune chopper inhibitors. And uh, I believe there are lots of other trials that are more advanced. They're trying to uh, see whether, uh, confirm whether the, uh, this combination uh, um, can be used as standard of care in the future. And this is um, just to show you an example. Uh, this is uh, the NIVO, um, um, NIVO EP study, which is uh, um, compared with uh, single agent NIVO and single agent EP. And you can see here that this continuation rate is around about 36% uh, uh, when you give uh, EP NIVO. And whereas uh, when you give it in single agent, it's around about uh, 10 to 15 percent. So the uh, combination of molecular target therapy and immune chop inhibitors is actually quite favorable when you compare that with the um, James Larkin's uh, uh, study of, uh, of uh, epinevo in uh, metastatic melanoma. Right, so uh, there are other uh, um, uh, immunotherapies apart from immune checkpoint inhibitors that's been tried, and, in, uh, and this is uh, the type for melanoma. So uh, in, in this particular phase two study uh, uh, by Clark et al., um, they followed up uh, with uh, of a very refinite, followed with high dose interleukin-2, and they reported there was no unexpected AEs. Um, and uh, interestingly, the uh, CR rate was around about 30%. So other uh, studies also looked at... Um, the use of uh, a high dose interleukin-2, and this time was in combination with verifinib. And in the translational work, uh, in which they had on treatment biopsies performed, uh, un unfortunately, they found that the regulatory T cells were actually upregulated by the use of a high dose interleukin-2, which is an immunosuppressive, uh, um, uh, um, um, has immunosuppressive activity. Um, finally, they also um, looked at the combination of verifinib with uh, cellular therapy, and the response rates was uh, quite good at around about 65%, and uh, the authors actually commented that there was no unexpected toxicities with the combination of cellular therapy with uh, targeted therapy. 
And then in renal cell cancer, um, the early uh, phase studies also reported that the, there was unacceptable rates of toxicities. As you can see here, there were high chances of getting other liver toxicities or, uh, or, um, or pneumonitis with various combinations of VEGF-TKIs or uh, with, uh, with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. So, um, as you can see here, but more recently, in a phase, uh, couple of phase one studies, uh, uh, examining the use of exitinib either with pembrolizumab or with evalumab, the risk of uh, liver toxicity is actually quite low, around about 5%. The risk of grade 3 diarrhea more was only about 8%. And um, this was reflected with both uh, with, uh, exitinib plus evalumab. And uh, the results of these two phase two studies led to the... Um, publication of, um, uh, in the New England Journal of uh, both the uh, Pembro plus exitinib and uh, Valumab plus exitinib versus the standard care in advanced uh, renal cell cancer. And this has led to, uh, at least for the first study of uh, Pembro and exitinib, um, the uh, approval of uh, this combination in the management of patients in uh, first-line uh, renal cell cancer. So it sh you, know, you can see here that the uh, risk of toxicity is actually quite f uh, comparable uh, to the, the previous standard of care, which is also sunitinib uh, in these uh, uh, two studies. And then finally, in uh, patients uh, with endometrial cancer, combining another VEGF uh, uh, TKI, lenvatinib, with uh, uh, pembrolizumab, I uh, just want to focus on the toxicities here, um, that the incidence of toxicity uh, was very low in terms of grade 3 uh, toxicity. There was 8% uh, of patients uh, developed uh, grade 3 uh, diarrhea, and about 34% of patients developed hypertension. And the risk of hypertension is very similar to um, single-agent lenvatinib. So there doesn't appear to be any additive or synergistic effect when you combine pembrolizumab to lenvatinib. And then, uh, interestingly, though, that the risk of uh, developing hypothyroidism was actually increased. So uh, normally, the risk of developing hypothyroidism with lenvatinib alone is around about 10 or 25%. But in this particular phase two study, the, uh, the risk of uh, developing hypothyroidism was, uh, was more, almost doubled to 47%. So there may be some uh, synergistic effect, uh, at least with hypothyroidism, when you combine lenvatinib to, uh, with pembrolizumab. So the uh, question is, is it com possible to combine target therapy with immune therapy? The answer is yes, at least in uh, other solid tumors apart from non-small cell lung cancer. So let's uh, just finally look at uh, some other learnings from other trials. I think that uh, there are lots of preclinical work that's shown that the uh, scheduling of the, of the treatments is highly important. So um, just to run through for the sake of time, that, that you can see that how you sequence, uh, for example, sunitinib to vaccine, or is it vice versa, or in combination, you get different uh, results depending on how, you, uh, how the sequencing is performed. And then another example with tramectinib, uh, you have a running period followed by combination, uh, or you give it the other way, have a running period of PD-1 followed by combination, you get reduced efficacy. And then finally, uh, vac even vaccines uh, uh, plus mTOR inhibitors, how you actually sequence it also has uh, different outcomes uh, as, uh, as reported here. So uh, these are some important learnings when it comes to sequencing. It's important to do preclinical work, decide what is the best uh, way to, uh, to schedule the treatment before embarking on early phase trials. So it appears that at least in a couple of these examples here that uh, the administration of a running period with a targeted therapy uh, prior to uh, uh, combining of immune checkpoint inhibitors may be more effective um, than vice versa. And this is an example, uh, this is a, a very nice design uh, in patients with melanoma. Uh, and they're trying to examine the, the actual sequencing. And this is a phase three study looking at uh, combining um, uh, dravafenib and trametinib first. Uh, followed by epinevo, or the reverse uh, combination in the second arm. So this will be a study that really uh, check whether the sequencing uh, um, uh, has, uh, has, uh, has, um, is important and, and the uh, primary outcome is a two-year survival rate. So we'll see how that st uh, particular study goes uh, in the future. And then and, um, we need better preclinical models. So uh, one of the hot uh, 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 targets is uh, inhibition of MAC. Uh, when you inhibit the MAC, it actually um, uh, you get increased T cell infiltration into the tumor, and you get upregulation of MHC class one. And, uh, and this is a phase one study that we're involved in. You can see here in the uh, CT scans on your left that there is actually a, 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 this is a patient with colorectal cancer, and uh, this patient was given a copimetinib plus a and there's a nice tumor shrinkage as shown here. 
And, um, and this led on to, a, and on, on treatment biopsies, you can see there was upregulation of pd one there was also uh, tumor infiltration of uh, T cells, and also increased uh, MHC uh, uh, expression as well. But unfortunately, an uh, IM Blaze 370, which is a phase three study of combining uh, tizolizumab uh, with cobimetonib versus the standard care in the third line setting, uh, unfortunately was actually a negative result. So uh, despite having um, the preclinical uh, setting that, that is actually quite favorable and the early phase results, this uh, phase three study actually uh, nailed uh, uh, um, the combination of cobimetonib and tizolizumab in the uh, same direction as the Eagle study and the Condor study. So, um, and, the, and you can see here that the, uh, the, the, the treatment uh, toxicities are actually uh, additive and the rates of discontinuation was much higher when you add atezolizumab to uh, cobimetonib as compared to single agent alone. So, in conclusion, immune checkpoint inhibitors provide an ideal backbone in uh, combination therapy with targeted agents. In lung cancer, there's no synergism seen in efficacy, uh, although the synergistic toxicity was observed. Uh, combination of TKIs and immune checkpoint inhibitors are, are highly active in renal cell cancer, melanoma, and other solid tumors. The toxicities, at least in non small cell lung cancer, is uh, uh, highly unpredictable. The selection of target agents and immune uh, checkpoint inhibitors is, is highly critical, and the novel combinations and the sequencing of treatment needs to be conducted uh, in the phase one setting. And finally, better preclinical models are required. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ross, for this excellent overview. Are there questions? Maybe. Yes, Bernhard. Thank you, that was very interesting. Do you have any idea why lung cancer is th th this time in the worse position than uh, others, than the renal cell cancer? So, in terms of um, Toxicity, no, because the host is supposed to be the same. The immune system, you know, should be similar because we are humans. Uh, it may be due to differences to uh, the patient's morbidity. Uh, lung cancer patients tend to have poorer performance status. They may be more advanced age. Uh, there may be reasons for that, but I don't think that's the only reason for that. Um, I mean, renal cell cancer patients are also elderly as well. So, um, but the agents that have been used in melanoma and in renal cell cancer are not, the, the targeted agents that are used are not used in uh, non small cell lung cancer though. So certainly it could be due to the, uh, the type of molecular uh, agents that is used. And in fact, the EGFR TKI, it appears to me, from my uh, layman's observation, that a lot of it may be uh, a more reasonable uh, uh, molecular targeted agent. It appeared to have less uh, toxicity when you com compare that with osimitinib or with uh, uh, gefitinib, it appears that uh, allotinib may have a more favorable profile when you combine that with immune chop inhibitors. And in fact, and then the, the, another study was the uh, use of fatinib with pembrolizumab. There was actually no uh, grade three, four toxicities that were reported when you combine a fatinib to pembrolizumab. So it may be due to the EGFR TKI, even though it may be the same class, uh, for some reason that uh, and no one has actually been able to elucidate why there are differences in between, within the same class, why there are differences in, in, the, in the toxicity. Good question, though. So, uh, conceptually, I understand uh, to say, okay, we use checkpoint inhibition to loosen the brakes uh, on the T cells and, and also target the tumor cells by TKI or an antibody that in the end results in and reduced signaling. And, and the, theoretically, the maximum expectation will be additive effects, um, while when you would add an immunostimulatory agent that either drives the tumor in immunogenic death or would stimulate the T cell, then you would um, assume that this would be a synergy. So um, I saw that you cited one study where IL-2 was given. That's right, yeah. And the response rate was 80%. It I was, think, um, you know, that was a BRAF was quite inhibitor. High, yeah. and, uh, so right, that was yeah. outstandingly high. So yeah. my question is, is that not a concept that um, is broader explored to add T cell stimulators or induce immun immunogenic death of uh, tumor cells? Yeah, I think you have to move beyond the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors, and you mentioned using immune stimulators instead of 
taking off the brakes, you want to actually apply the accelerator. So um, I think it may be dependent on the, on the tumor microenvironment as well. And I think uh, tumors such as melanoma, for example, actually the tumor microenvironment is probably more favorable to um, uh, modulating the, uh, the immune system compared to non-small cell lung cancer. I mean, there are high rates of pseudoprogression, for example, in melanoma, and, and uh, the use of, um, of a combination IO-IO is actually more effective in the melanoma setting compared with non-small non cell lung cancer. So um, I think there are, there are uh, uh, trials that are ongoing of using uh, immune stimulators such as uh, IO-2 or the variants of IO-2 in non-small cell lung cancer in combination with immune chapter inhibitors. So, um, so there are some, you know, some early data that suggests that it may be more effective in particular subtypes of non-small cell lung cancer. Yeah. So there are trials examining the use of um, cytokines, basically, in combination with um, uh, immune chapter inhibitors. Yeah. So thank you very much again. No